Hello, if you've got to this video, it's good news because it is the last video for the A2 microeconomics course and we're looking at cost benefit analysis, weighing up all of those benefits um, against those costs. So it looks like it's quite a big section, but it's, it's not really and it's quite a wordy section if you are to write an essay on it. Um, sometimes it comes up as a 25 mark essay because it is evaluative. There's, um, you know, there's benefits of using this method, but there's lots of problems as well. So before we go into what it is, we have some key terms to learn. So this is actually a bit of a recap, actually, from when you did uh, negative externalities and positive externalities. So we've got private costs, which are costs that occur to the producer or the consumer. So the, the people taking part in the, um, the decisions, uh, deciding whether to consume or to produce to produce, sorry, and external costs, which are costs to third parties. Uh, these are people that are not involved in the decision making and social costs are the private costs plus the external costs. So social costs are the, just the full cost of the activity. And we've got private benefits, which are benefits to the consumer or producer, external benefits, benefits for third party. Whenever you have external benefits, sorry, you might not have realized this actually, whenever you have external costs, that means that there's a negative externality, either in production or consumption. Whenever you have external benefits, that means that there's a positive externality in production or consumption. So external benefits are benefits that accrue or occur to a third party. And social benefits are again, just adding up those private benefits and those external benefits. So we've got a full, uh, truer uh, picture of the benefits that occur because of this action. And cost benefit analysis is a method to analyze the ratio of costs to benefits or benefits to costs. You could write it the other way around as well. So if we have a look at an example, this, this should uh, illustrate it a little bit more. HS2, which is a high speed um, train link, second train link, because the first one would have been the Channel Tunnel. And this is a planned route between London and Birmingham, um, which will have a lot of seats on, as you can see, and uh, is um, uh, carrying very long trains as well. Um, and they're gonna operate uh, very they're, they're up specially built tracks so they're very fast and uh, so you'll have quicker journey times and it is meant to bring benefits to lots of different areas but let's have a, a look this is basically a map of it this is the proposed first route up to Birmingham and then there will be this kind of like fork forking of the route and a branch up to um, Yorkshire and Leeds and Manchester uh, this way but um, there's a lot of controversy over it and you can read about some of those things online. But in terms of doing a cost benefit analysis, we'd look at the private costs, which cost to build it. Um, it's going to be a public sector um, project, so it's it's going to cost the government money to build it. But it might be funded under a kind of private finance initiative as well. There might be some private um, sector involvement in it. Um, and the private benefits would be um, to the company that's... Um, franchised uh, gets the franchise agreement to be able to run on it they get the revenue from customers but the customers getting a faster journey time they think it's going to be about half an hour quicker to get from Birmingham to, to London However, there will be some external costs, so environmental damage. Um, there'll be a lot of disruption as well when they're building this route and um, people uh, having to move. There'll be destruction of homes. Um, there'll be destruction, some people say there's destruction of like natural habitats and beautiful wildlife and scenery and those types of things. But the external benefits, so I think really what's... Um, kind of swaying this people are thinking of the increased benefits to business in Birmingham um, because there's often this this um, view that London gets a lot of the the economic benefits of the country so they have this huge financial sector and um, and it's not the benefits that the London are getting are not really um, fairly spread uh, amongst the the rest of the people in the country so they're thinking well if we have faster business routes between London and Birmingham this should bring um, multiplier effects, Birmingham increased spending in Birmingham, uh, increased business, more jobs, those types of things. And they're hoping as well with the forking off to Leeds and uh, Manchester that that will also spread some of the GDP growth there. Um, 
So the stages of carrying out cost benefit analysis, they have to identify all the re relevant costs and benefits. However, I'm going to do my um, evaluation as I go along because each stage actually has problems. Where do you draw the line? What point do you stop counting? And it's not just about um, how far do we look for external benefits and external costs. It's actually how far into the future do we look for external benefits and external costs? Because if you're looking at that, that external benefit, increased business in Birmingham for how many years? years because these these investment projects as well you know think about our re railways um your victorian creations really uh, would they have carried out a cost benefit analysis and thought you know in 2016 someone's going to take the train and benefit and that's going to benefit this town because they're going to bring money in it's really going to be very hard to draw the line in terms of what time scale you're looking at the benefits accruing but also how far you're looking at the external costs and the external benefits Secondly, and I think this is an even harder thing to do, you've got to place monetary values on all the costs and benefits. Now, some of those things are going to be easier to place monetary values. We're going to we're going to be able to, well, we might not be able to estimate accurately the numbers of people that are going to take the service, but we should be able to um, know. Um, reasonably well the type of well <laughs> I'm saying this but if you can't accurately estimate how many people are going to take the service it's going to be hard to estimate the revenue but it should be easier I'll pick a better example it should be easier to estimate the costs of um of uh the the project well you say that these public sets of projects often run over budget but um there was a i think it was a swiss project that's just um opened on time and or even earlier and on budget so maybe our european neighbors are a bit better at estimating these things but things like costs revenue those are things that are uh, dealt with in money anyway monetary values anyway but the external benefits external costs they often don't have monetary values on them. How can you put a monetary value on a beautiful scenery that's spoiled because of uh, building work, noise pollution? How can you put a value on air pollution when it's it's not a, a, a market for clean air? You don't walk into a, your look and lose agents and say, can I have a can of clean air, please? Or can I have an unspoiled view? So what you have to do is get these shadow prices, it's called. So this is where we estimate prices where there is no market price. And so what we might do is we might look at um, the price of property um, before and, and after, you know, major construction and look at how it's changed property values. We might also do something, these are kind of like surveys where they do revealed preferences and find out how much people would pay um, for a beautiful view or not to have a beautiful view spoil and those types of things. But they're never, you know, really accurate indicators because there are just there aren't markets for these external benefits and these external costs so the second problem is how do we actually put monetary values on them and the monetary values is what is going to determine whether this project gets the go ahead or it doesn't get the go ahead so it's really very important then we have to discount the benefits and costs that occur in the future because uh, we've got to have this like time value of money so um the, the reason for this is that um, a pound today is not going to be worth a pound, uh, what a pound is worth in 20 years time. And we know this from macroeconomics, we've got inflation and all those kind of things. But even if we didn't have inflation, a pound today isn't going to be worth what it's worth in 20 years time, even if there was no inflation. Because what you could do with a pound today is you could invest it or use it for business ideas. And so that you could um, turn that into a hundred pounds or a thousand pounds or a million pounds, that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? Or a billion pounds. Um, within 20 years time so um, we place a much higher value on money that occurs or uh, accrues or that you gain um, at the beginning of the project than money at the end of the project and one of the problems with um, discounting these costs and benefits is the costs are well that one there as well choosing an appropriate discount value is difficult because we're looking at we're, we're going to have to discount some of these um, costs and benefits over the, pe the period that we think that this train line is going to be used for now i said before about train lines being built in victorian times so you know doing discounting the costs and benefits over a hundred years it's, it's not going to be 
very realistic and it's going to really skew the figures. It's, it's going to be very, very difficult to do. And usually you um, you take uh, maybe the current interest rate as your discount value. But that's going to be really difficult as well to use because we don't know what the interest rate is going to be in the future. So it's it's really mathematically quite difficult to actually do in practice and another issue that occurs is that often the costs might be upfront or certainly occurring within the first few years of the project uh, the major costs there'll be maintenance costs but the major costs like the infrastructure building it whereas the benefits are going to occur um, much further into the future so it's really the benefits that you're going to be um, using this kind of discounting method and discounting uh, and if you choose um, uh, an unrealistic discounting value then it's going to skew your figures as well so that can be difficult uh, and then the fourth stage is just to compare your costs your benefits to the costs and um, usually the government might have a few different options to choose between so um, you want to pick the uh, option which has the highest ratio of benefits to costs obviously because that's going to give you the best return on the investment um, and I don't have any problems there's, there's no problem going to come up with that one but um, you can see there there's lots and lots of problems with doing cost by analysis so here I've got another slide for the limitations <laughs> Uh, it also doesn't fully reflect the distributional impacts of the investment. So if we're thinking about high speed two, we might think of a lot of the benefits occurring in maybe the Birmingham area, maybe the London area. But what about um, the costs? Well, a lot of the cost is, is really in the, the countryside that's between maybe London and Birmingham um, because that's where those people are going to have to move houses. They're going to have the, the, the beautiful scenery um, destroyed, possibly. So it, it's a bit unequal who's getting the benefits and who's getting the costs. And we know government failure can occur where public sector projects are often influenced by politics as well. Um, None of the politicians, that, well, I highly doubt that any of the politicians that we have in office at the moment are still going to be in office by the time, if HS2 does open, by the time it does open, because they're thinking about, um, I think it's 2033 that it's going to open, and that's phase one. Um, so that's really far into the future. So I think, um, I think David Cameron might have wanted to move on to other things by that point. <laughs> Um, this is cost benefit analysis done of the smoking ban. I thought this was really, really interesting. Um, just draw uh, your attention to some of these um, values here. Um, so it's the loss of satisfaction. So it's really interesting that they've been able to put this monetary value on loss of satisfaction. Some of these things um, are easier to put health um, to put costs on monetary values because they're kind of health benefits. So you can look at well, how much does smoking cost the NHS each year? Although that's going to be hard to work out as well um, because it's often you know you can't often like isolate things all the time. You know, someone that has health problems, it might be because of a poor diet as well. Um, although I suppose lung cancer is more attributable to smoking problems um, but yeah I just I think this loss of satisfaction um, to continuing smokers and, and to quitters and, and I, I find this loss of satisfaction to continuing smokers I suppose the smoking ban is like oh that they can't smoke inside so they've even put a monetary value on that and it, it's so interesting how they get these monetary values but the point is if this is altered you know 550 million pounds worth if that had you know if you'd have estimated that to be much much lower then you might find um the 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 project looks a lot more attractive if this was estimated to be much much higher you might find that the costs outweigh the benefits so a lot of these are quite subjective and, de and normative things uh they it might come down to a lot of debate about how much that's actually worth because there is no market for it. And that's the end of the course. Well done. Good luck in your exams.